CD rep is here, Dr. Agil, no, no, Dr. Annie Kitty from Pushveri uh, College. He, she, she's a periodontist, professor of periodontist. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Very good morning. Please don't call me, sir. I'm a kid for all of you all. You know that. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> all the best, Dr. Akhil. I think I need it. Thank you. <laughs> Now we are on YouTube live. Okay. Okay, sir. I think all our members are in, all the office bearers are in, right? No, participants are 63. Yes. Uh, now it's 10.59. Uh, uh, others will start. Yes, we can start now. Yeah. Yes. Agil, uh, Dr. Agil, Adarsh is my son, he is the MC for today's. Hello, Dr. Agil. <laughs> I, I guessed from the name that I had on the screen, <laughs> stepping into a very big man's shoes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess we can start now then. Yes. Dear attendees, we are about to begin with our webinar. Before we start, I request you all to stay on mute throughout the session. Any doubts or questions can be asked via the chat box or comment section. Also, for your info, the program will be streaming live on our YouTube channel, IDA Thirivalla. And for more details, you can visit www.idathirivalla.org. So once again, a very warm welcome to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to be the master of ceremony for today's webinar. I, Dr. Adarsh Nainan Sam, on behalf of Indian Dental Association, Thirivalla branch, would like to extend a very warm welcome to all gathered here for the first webinar of our branch. IDA Thirivalla was formed in 2008 and is one among the most vibrant branches of IDA with several state and national appreciations and leaders throughout its journey. Our focus has been mainly for charity programs covering various segments in the society. So without much delay, let's move on with our today's program. I invite the president of IDA Thrilla branch, Dr. Reggie Thomas, to deliver the welcome speech and give away his presidential address. Dr. Reggie, please. Thank you, Adarsh. Good morning, everyone. Today's 30th day, January is observed as Mama Martyrs Day. On this date in 1948, Mahatma Gandhi, father of our nation, was assassinated. Let us pay homage to Mahatma and all martyrs who laid down their lives for, for the freedom of the nation. Let's remain silent for one minute. Okay. Respected speaker and the star of the day, our faculty, Dr. Akhil Reshamala, senior professors, senior practitioners, my dear friends. Today, I'm del delighted to stand in front of you this is the first CD program of our branch. We are honored to have an international speaker, my friend, Dr. Akhil Reshamal. I am associating with Dr. Akhil from 2004 onwards at a three-year workshop on occlusion at Toronto. After that, in 2010, we are able to conduct a CD 
program with Dr. Akul at Mamak First Auditorium, Tiruvalla. At that time, Dr. Samuel was the president, uh, state president. The, that CD had the highest recorded number of participants of about 1,500. Dr. Akhil is a good friend of mine and most vibrant and energetic faculty. He is a good academician, an excellent speaker who keeps updated. Sir, on behalf of Idea Tirivella, with great joy, I welcome you to this online platform. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's my pleasure, sir. Our, uh, our CD program is going to be inaugurated by our young, vibrant CD chairman, Dr. Nishant Krishna. I welcome Dr. Nishant to our midst. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Nishant. Our enthusiastic CD representative, Dr. Annie Kitty George, Professor of Periodontics, Pushperi College of Dental Science, Tiruvalla. I welcome you to this program. To today's moderator are Dr. Shibi Matthew and Dr. Sonu Elsa, two young professors of ID Trivella branch. I welcome both of you to this function. I welcome Dr. Adash Jain and Sam, today's master of ceremony, to this function. I welcome all professors, practitioners, and students to this function. I welcome senior members of ID Trivella, my executive committee members, all participants who log in to listen or faculty. People behind today's program, IPP Dr. Simon George, President-elect Dr. Lanu Abraham, Dr. Samuel Nainan, or past state president, Honorary Secretary Dr. Thomas Jacob, Dr. Akhilesh Pradab, uh, uh, Treasurer Dr. Seema Joseph, <laughs> Dr. Saji Kurian, Dr. Sa Raji Simon. Those, uh, those efforts made this program today possible. I am not taking much of our faculty's time. So friends, go ahead. Have a great day. Have a great session ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reji. We are honored with the presence of IDA Kerala State CDE Chairman, Dr. Nishant Krishna, joining from Trivandrum. Dr. Nishant Krishna graduated from Sri Mukambika Institute of Dental Sciences. He has been an active member of IDA since 2007 and has served as the CDE convener, vice president, and currently the honorary treasurer of IDA Trivandrum branch. He is an executive member of IDA Kerala State since 2015 and has backed the recipient of Excellence Award for the year 2020. Now I invite Dr. Nishant Krishna to inaugurate the CDE activities of IDA Trivella for the year 2022 and also to address the gathering. Thank you, Doctor. Am I audible? Yes, Doctor, you're audible. Yes. Uh, thank you, Doctor. President Dr. Rajit Thomas, Secretary Dr. Thomas Jacob, CD Representative Dr. Anikiti George, and uh, IDA Thiruvallas Senior Member, past uh, President of IDA Kerala State Branch, <coughs> and past Secretary, Founder Member of IDA Hope and Legal Self Chairman, Dr. Samuel Lenan. A warm, warm good morning, sir. Uh, today, I, I, I congratulate IDA Thiruvalla Branch for conducting such a such a beautiful program with a, such an eminent and highly highly sought after speaker uh, in India, Dr. Akhil Reshamwala. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I know the constraints of a, a, a online program. I'm not munching much of your time, sir. Idea Kerala no, State no. Branch extends the support of Tiruvalla Branch on this occasion, and let me let me uh, and on this occasion, I I I I I I officially declare the CD activities of Idea Tiruvalla Branch to be uh, inaugurated and the webinar open for all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Genuinely appreciate. It. Thank you, Nishant. Thank you, Dr. Nishant. Now I invite Dr. Annie Kitty George. CDE representative of IDA Thiruvalla branch to brief us about today's program and introduce the moderators for the day. Handing over to you, Dr. Annie. Dr. Annie, are you there? Yes. 
Dr. Adish, hello. Yes, yes, you're audible, Dr. Ani. You can continue. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning, one and all. In a few minutes from now, we will be listening to Dr. Akhil Reshambala, a prosthodontist and implantologist, and also a renowned international speaker and educator. He will be speaking to us on the topic, managing full mouth rehabilitation cases digitally with ease. We have two passionate prosthodontists as moderators for the session, Dr. Shibi Matthew and Dr. Sono Elsa John. Dr. Shibi completed her graduation in 2002 from KVT Dental College, Sulia, and her post-graduation in prosthodontics from the Pushpagiri College of Dental Sciences, Tiruvalla, in the year 2018. She is currently working as senior lecturer in prosthodontics at Pushpagiri College of Dental Sciences. Dr. Sonu Elsa John has completed graduation from Savita Dental College, Chennai in 2014 and post-graduation in prosthodontics from Thai Mogambiga Dental College and Hospitals in 2018. She's currently working as a consultant prosthodontist. Now, let me hand over to the moderators. Thank you, Doctor, for the warm welcome. On behalf of ID Tiruvalla, I welcome you all to the first webinar of 2022 at ID Tiruvalla branch. It's an honor to have with us today the pioneer in the field of prosthodontics and full mouth rehabilitation. He's a dynamic speaker, a gifted orator, and a great teacher by himself, Dr. Akhil Sajat Reshambala. As we all are aware, Dr. Akhil is a renowned prosthodontist and oral implantologist from the city of Navi, Mumbai. Sir is married to Mrs. Samira and they are blessed with a lovely daughter, Asisa. Sir has completed his graduation from the Bombay University and his post-graduation prosthodontics and oral implantology from the prestigious University of Queensland, Australia. Sir started off his career with Dr. Rajit Shetty's surgery, following which he worked as a consultant prosthodontist and oral implantologist at Mumbai, Navi Mumbai and Thane. Later on, Sir started his private practice in the city of Navi Mumbai. Dr. Akhil sir has backed several awards. To mention a few, he was the outstanding student. Dr. Shibi, your mic is on mute. Okay, uh, yeah, sorry, sir. So he, uh, he was the outstanding student of the year from International House, Brisbane. He was also appointed as the Faculty of Prosthodontics for the Indian Academy of Interdisciplinary Dentistry. Sir is also a fellow of International Congress of Oral Implantologists and fellow of ITA Society of Osho Integration. Akil sir has conducted several talks on full mouth rehabilitation, occlusion, venice, all ceramic restorations, implant prosthodontics, and digital approach to dentistry. Sir is also the keynote speaker for several national and international conferences the latest being the 49th, Interna 49th IPS National Virtual Conference held in December 2021. Apart from academics, Akil Sir is also a good dancer. With the advancement in digital dentistry, it is of prime significance to understand the importance of managing full mouth rehabilitation cases digitally with ease. Development of digital protocols will help patient, uh, clinicians to deliver smile of high precision and predictable aesthetics to our patients. We humbly and wholeheartedly welcome you once again back to Idea Tirvalla, sir. Today, with immense pleasure, we as a branch, we are very elated to welcome you as a speaker of our first CD program of the year 2022. We welcome you, sir. Just a short notice to the participants, kindly keep your uh, questions posted in the Zoom or the YouTube chat box, and uh, we would be addressing it at the end of the session. I now invite Dr. Akhil to take over the floor for today's webinar on managing full mouth rehabilitation cases digitally with ease. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Actually, I have very fond memories of this particular branch. Uh, and uh, like Dr. Reggie mentioned about the stuff we did with Dr. Samuel Linen and and my first lecture that I met him in 2004 when I was, I could probably say just a little kid who had uh, just come back from Australia and started lecturing in this country. So thank you. It's been now what, 
around 18 years that 15 or 18 years i don't remember i'm not very good at math so my numbers start at zero they end at 32 because being a dentist that's all i care about <laughs> so uh thank you very much for inviting me back uh especially for the first uh cd program for the year uh today's topic is on um, you know digitally uh managing these full mouth rehab cases uh when i first met this branch, I spoke everything about full mouth, but it was all in the analog world. Now, as, as time changes, so so do we. You know, you remember those days where we used to get those Nokia phones that could only probably receive a call and make a call, and then maximum you could do was send a text message. Then came what Blackberries, then came the WhatsApps, the Facebooks, and today we are all into these uh, touch phones with which we survive. I mean, uh, it took us a while probably to change over from that, you know, old school of, you know, you remember those phones they used to go to dial a number and every time you had to redial, you had to go through all of that all over again. So that is the analog world. And then suddenly you are on a touch phone where you just redial and it calls by itself. So that is how digitalization will help you in changing uh, things from the past to the present and then hopefully even taking you onward into the future. So today's uh, presentation, uh, I would I want to put a disclaimer today and I want to say that please do not get paranoid or do not let what I show you affect your confidence. Instead, I want you to realize that when I started with digital dentistry, even I thought, no, it's you know all about softwares and how will I manage this and why should I do this? I'm very happy with my impressioning material. I'm very happy with you know taking a a wax up from the lab, converting that into my patient's mouth. But as I started getting into digital dentistry, my life became easy. So I have a very simple question for everybody here: Do you want to spend more time with your patient? on the chair or do you want that with the least amount of sittings you get out of that case you complete that case your patient happy you happy and at the same time you have predictable results now digital dentistry allows you to plan your outcome even before you've started the case now I'm sure there are a lot of people here who, who do, you know, a lot of these full mouth cases. And you must have realized that you start somewhere, then you end up somewhere. Halfway through the treatment, you need to change certain protocols. You may have to go back. There are certain teeth that require, you know, root canals because they were not in the right position when you started doing the final. Something was way out. Your gingival tissue was not in the right position. So all of this can be planned beforehand. I'm also going to share with you all a case which I have done digitally in the full mouth implant case. It's an ongoing case, but I feel, you know, because this is the start of the year, and by the end of the year, I should have that entire case completely completed so I can come back to you all and share it again. But show you all how I now plan my full mouth implant cases also digitally. It is um, something which will become a norm for every clinic because your end result becomes predictable it is uh, you know you can you can predetermine what your end result is going to be all right so with that i'm going to start with my first slide with this first slide says you know you must have done a lot of these online courses webinars through the uh, you know pandemic time and and see even till today i would love to have been there uh, in person talking to you all uh because what i miss most is the warmth of you people from kerala and i cannot forget the food from there so i am missing out on both and yet i am here talking to you online so i'm going to share with you When you watch too many things online and you don't really do any of that, uh, you know, uh, clinically or you don't learn it.
from a person clinically, these things happen. So don't let these things come in, in and affect you. We will try, I'll try and simplify things for you so you don't have these issues in your practice. Now, this is a classification of full mark cases that I have kind of formulated where you find that a typical where, uh, I'm trying to see if I can get rid of this, okay, yeah. Uh, you can find wear of teeth with loss of vertical, um, vertical dimension. Can I see my face only and not the others over here? Is there any way if the moderators can manage that? If it's possible, I need a little help here, sorry. Anybody? Yes, sir, we'll just check into that. Uh, so that, you know, on the screen, it doesn't cover the screen. So you can see more of my slide at the same time, you can see me too, you know, otherwise it becomes pretty mundane on a, <clears throat> okay, I'll continue uh, till you guys figure that out. So uh, I am trying to see, see here because if I can have my uh, this year and not somebody else's. Ah, that's good. Thank you very much. Whoever did that, God bless you. Okay, so uh, let me go back and we start all over again. So we have the first classification, which is a typical full mouth case, which means you have wear. When people see wear, the first thing they think, think about is, I need to add, I need to increase the vertical dimension, but I need to bring this to your notice is that vertical dimension is not determined by just the teeth. It is determined by the entire musculature, the ligaments and the whole stomatognathic you know, uh, uh, apparatus here. So if you just look at teeth like this and say, okay, I need to increase the vertical dimension, you might be going wrong. Now, I always have been sharing this technique, which I learned actually from uh, Professor Karl Misch. Uh, and he taught me this years ago when he had come to India, uh, is this technique about how to determine the vertical dimension of a patient. And he said, Akil, what do we do normally? We normally ask the patient to take a sip of water, swallow, relax, take the tongue to the back of your mouth. These are, you know, these are all these different techniques. Then we make, do markings on the nose, on the chin. These are landmarks which move. He says you should use landmarks which are more steady. The base of the nose, the base of the chin. These are landmarks that you should be looking at. So he taught me a technique which Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and Michelangelo used for all their sculptures and their paintings is that the human body is nothing but a mathematical formula. And he said that most cases, I repeat, most cases, if you measure the distance from, uh, if you ask the patient to hold their palm out straight, you guys can also try it whilst I am talking, your right hand or your working hand is the right uh, hand that you need to hold up. You hold your thumb flat towards your palm and the distance between the tip of the thumb and your index finger, this distance is actually your vertical dimension. So if you see this, this is the vertical dimension. And what I normally do is I use this. This is known as a Willis gauge, right? A Willis gauge, I mark this onto my patients, tighten this screw, and here I go. That's my vertical dimension. So with this, I determine whether there is only wear or there is wear along with supra eruption. So there is a process where there is wear of your teeth, but the physiological movement of the teeth compensate for that wear and they supra erupt. As you can very clearly see in this area here, you see there is buttressing of bone, which means there is, there is supra eruption. So here, if you just add and open up the bite, you will encroach the vertical dimension for this patient. The patient is going to end up with a TMD. Right? So you have to be very careful and very careful of these kind of uh, situations. Then you have a third situation where T 
teeth are completely worn out and the entire bony protuberances, the entire supra eruption has compensated for the vertical. So if I were to measure on the outside for this patient, he will show no loss of vertical. But if you look into his mouth, he's got a complete loss of teeth. Now, this is the kind of cases where you have to make a call whether you need to extract all those teeth, convert this patient into an implant full mouth because he's got bone, or should we do some kind of crown lengthening? So this is a whole process, which unfortunately I can't uh, you know, explain in, in such a short period of time, but I want you to be aware of cases like this. Then of course you have you know, the fourth type where you have mutilation of the entire dentition. You don't know where to go. Should I save this tooth? Should I not save this tooth? So I will try and show you two cases today, only two cases. One is with natural teeth, one is with implants because I have a stipulated time of an hour and a half and I'll try and finish as much as I can in that hour and a half. So this is your first type of case. Now, this is how I used to do my dentistry years ago. All right. Now, when I see, when I see uh, a case like this and I have measured the vertical dimension, I know that there is a drop in the vertical because the wear of the teeth was faster than the supra eruption of these teeth. Right? So I know that the vertical dimension can be corrected with addition. This is the simplest form of full mouth rehab. I believe me, this is the simplest form of full mouth rehab. You send this case. So there are ways to do it. Right Now, there are a lot of schools of thought. Some people will put this patient on a splint, okay, a full mouth splint. Get the patient to relax their muscles, get them to work on it come back to you once they say that they are comfortable with this increase of vertical, you convert it then into some kind of provisional. Then from that on, from there onwards, you convert them into permanence. Some people will put them on deep programmers. What are deep the coist type, the you know, leaf gauge and your um, the NTI device. Now, with years that I have used all of these kind of stuff, I used to find that the best kind of deprogrammer or a best kind of splint is something which the patient can actually chew and live their normal life with. All these other deprogrammers are programmers or, 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 or devices which actually the patient only wears in the night or when they're not chewing, when they're not eating, you know, things like that. They don't wear it when they go to work. So it is like your patient is snapping in and out, in and out. So I had devised a technique in those days where I used to do a full mouth rehab buildup in composite. Yes, some people might go and say, wow, you know, that's like, you know, that's hard work. But believe me, it was not hard work if you know how to follow uh, the protocol and, and of course, go step by step. So I'll discuss how I used to go through these cases. This is the drop in the vertical dimension that you see here, right? So you very clearly notice you have the cingulum wear here, very typically seen in these kind of cases. And you can see the anterior teeth wear here. You see a lot of you know, crowns which have been given to this patient. Look at this. Now, when you see a bridge which has an excess opening, your alarm bells should ring. There is something wrong here occlusally. There is something wrong here occlusally. The PDL is inflamed. The patient is in pain after that prosthesis was delivered to the patient. Again, a very huge topic, but I'm just trying to bring it to your notice. So this is what the patient came in with. Now, what I did was I measured his vertical dimension. And you see the loss of vertical dimension that this patient has. Now, please understand this is vertical dimension at rest. At occlusion, it will be minus two. You create your leeway or your leeway space, right? Now, depending whether it's a skeletal class one, skeletal class two, or a skeletal class three, you create your leeway space accordingly. There are different values for different uh, skeletal classes, right? So in this case, he was a skeletal class one and it was, you know, two mm. So on this measurement that I got, I minus two mm and I use this gaze. It is known as Willie's gauge. Okay. This is known as a Willie's gauge. Uh, if you can't find it online, do connect with me. I will help you with trying to procure it. So what I did was 
I started never add on the length of your incisors first because the length don't determine the vertical they only are for aesthetics right so i started adding on the cingulum because it the lower teeth go and connect with your cingulum and that is how the increase in vertical dimension takes place the length right now has got nothing to do with the increase in vertical dimension so i just used to etch bond take some composite packet there and then build up on your two anteriors lower anteriors now all your D programmers that I, I spoke about, they all start with the anterior here. Basically, what you want to do is put your lower jaw into CR, put your mandible into CR. So you're basically creating an anterior guidance. When you create that anterior guidance, the jaw moves into CR, it gets the right vertical. And once you get that, now I can't leave this patient like that, right? It is, he's not going to be comfortable chewing on something like this. So with this, then once I've determined this height, how do I determine the length of my central incisors? I'll tell you a very simple technique. You know, ask the patient to count from, or uh, say a four letter F word, which is five, okay? You ask the patient to count from 50 to 60. Now you go 51, 52, 53. So where, as the patient is counting, that incisal edge, the the, the, the fine line of the incisal edge should just about touch the vermilion border. If your patient says, oh doc, it's impinging into my lower lip, right? Off, it needs to go shorter, all right? And if you have this situation like that, 51, 52, 53, where the air is actually passing through, that means the tooth is still short. Now, this is a very good way to determine the length. And then, of course, you use your muscles, your lips. And there are a lot of techniques of aesthetic uh, you know, rehabilitation, which I'm not getting into. But this is what I normally use for a patient which I am working completely blind. These were all analog days. In the digital, I will show you a completely different trick. Yeah. So once you do that, you've got this vertical. Now with this vertical, what I used to do is I used to build up the canines next and then just add a flat layer of composite on the back to just increase the vertical. No carving, no nothing. Make the patient like a cow, you know. But the patient has two things, canine guidance and anterior guidance, which are the two main things. In a splint, what do you have? You don't have occlusal surfaces, right? You have a flat surface. So what I create here is something that the patient can use on a daily basis. He can chew with it. He can. He comes back. Now, if, I, if he finds it too high, you trim it down. And it's easy. How easy is it to, if you find it, it's too short again, you can add composite, you can just etch, bond and add. So it's easy to make these changes. Of course, you can also play around with the canine to canine aesthetics in this, and you can get the patient really sorted out with a technique like this. Now you see in this case, we have got this side sorted out. I prepped the posteriors. Why did I start in this case? I normally like to do the anteriors first, but in this case, I did the posteriors because he had all these uh, old bridges that needed to be removed. And uh, once I've done that, I didn't know whether I needed root canals, what was the state of the root canal. So I've tried to finish all of that. Once I've done that, I take a silicon bite index, send it off to the lab, I don't like to play with my vertical dimension in this phase because once I've adjusted the vertical dimension, if you prep every tooth, you've lost your vertical dimension. Your patient's gonna go back to square one. And then you end up having to take wax rims inside the mouth, take those bites. No, you create something, you leave it there till you have decided and you know for sure that this is my vertical dimension. So I use my anteriors as my stops for vertical in this case, take a silicon bite uh, index for the posterior, send it off, and then later on come ahead, come to the anteriors, once I've bonded or cemented the posteriors, in this case we had cemented because there was zirconia, bridges because there were bridges, anteriors are Emacs or lithium disilicate, that's how we finish this case. So this is how we increase the vertical dimension for this case but you realize it was a working splint or a working guide right now as you probably realize and you kind of understand that this took me time it took me a few sittings but even then we finished this case in around six to seven sittings because my protocols are pretty straightforward so what do i do today what do i look at differently Yes, the 
Nagy csal! Alright, I think this will do. Real happy. Oops. So you'll see a lot of cars through my presentation, but uh, you know uh, that is how I like to explain things. Now, um, uh, also I would like you to understand that uh, people might think digital meaning there's a lot of expense. I will have to procure this. I will have to procure that. How will I work with so much? I have so much of investments. I have just about post pandemic managed to get my clinic going. I'm just about getting my patients back in. How am I going to put so much of investment? Um, I have one simple suggestion. The maximum that you require to do something digital is a intraoral scanner. And today, you have a lot of labs, a lot of companies that actually give you a scanner for hire. For 2,000 rupees, they will come and help you to do a scan. Now, when you're doing a case that big, if you don't want to invest into those, you know, huge amounts in lakhs, call this person to come to your practice, do the scan, send the STL file to your lab, and they will do the needful. Okay? So, do not get... Uh, you know, uh, afraid of the fact that, oh my God, we have used it, huge investments to make. No, I do not want to show you all anything that makes you feel that you need to go backwards or you need to invest a lot. I will try and make this as simple as possible. So I started using now this technique for increasing my vertical dimension. So see, this is a new patient that walks in. He's also a doctor and he happens to be the father of a dentist. So this dentist brings in his father and says, you know, doc, I need you to help me look at his teeth. He's got a lot of wear. So we took some photographs. These are all, you know, these photographs are, uh, are uh, like, a, you know, a, a, a protocol for uh, doing the smile designing. Once the smile designing is done, we did a two dimensional smile designing. This is all done on a software. Do you have to do it? No, you outsource this, but use this technique to help you in your practice you know and outsourcing this today to somebody like um, you know like dr aslam is inamdar who does this there are a lot of labs who do it they don't charge you an arm and leg please you do not have to think about doing this by yourself you yes of course you have idiots like me who want to do it but you know you don't need to put in that effort just outsource it but use the end result and this now only request is when you outsource Please, as a dentist, you know your patient, you know your requirements. Please, in your notes, write down whatever you need so that the digital technician there can understand your, what you're looking for from this case and give you the end result. Otherwise, they don't have anything right there. They don't have the patient talking to them. They don't know what the patient wants. So they are completely clueless. And then you have issues where things don't match. So you see the uh, image on the left is the one which is not designed and this one is the one which is designed, right? So this is what the digital designing looks like. Once the digital designing has been done, can you see? You can actually see cuspal inclinations. It's, it's all there. It's all done. He also gives you information on where you need crown lengthening, where you don't need crown lengthening, how much of crown lengthening. This digital designing, can he can also produce, the lab can also produce a crown lengthening a guide and give it to you if you need. But believe me, it's very easy. If you take a pro -tem index into the patient's mouth, you will be able to mark this and uh, finish it. So I'll show you step by step. Don't worry. When I say a pro -tem index, you will be wondering what, what is he talking about? So these are indications of where I need crown lengthening. Yeah. Now, once I have all of that, I take it into my patient's mouth. You know, typical. I took this picture on purpose. 
typical when a patient walks into your practice. They don't care about hygiene. They don't. But luckily for me, this patient had a clean tissue. Can you see the tissue is healthy? A little bit of, you know, put stuck here and there. That's all right. So what I did was, what I did was, uh, oopsie daisy, sorry. I made a printed the model of that particular uh, designing. On that model, I used a clear silicone to create an index. And for every tooth, I am making a small little entry point for my injectable composite. Yeah. So here you see, I'm going to show this case, uh, just the procedure of how I do this build up. And then we'll go to a case where I'll show you how I do it in the entire case. So first, no prep. You're not touching the tooth with a burr at all. You just, you know, if you need to, you can sandblast it. If you have an air abrasion unit in your practice, if you don't, it's okay. You just etch the entire. Now, how I like to do it is canine to canine first. Then I like to go to my posteriors. I don't want to do everything in one shot. It becomes too difficult to control things. Yeah. And here, I'm not also worried about keeping each tooth separate because I'm going to prep them any which way. Yeah. This is a case where I'm going to prep all these teeth, either for veneers, for crowns, for whatever. So all my contact points are going to open up. If I were to have done this for just you know, long-term provisional, then I would keep them separate. And to do that would be, the way to do it would be alternate teeth. And you put these Teflon tapes, excuse me, basically your plumber's tape, you know, in between. I call it the PTFE, All right. So here you see me applying the bond to the entire tooth surface. And like you can see, this is absolutely real time. This is not, uh, you know, Oops, lost it. And once I have done that, I suck out all the bond, yeah, the excess bond. You can cure it. So you do a quick cure of the entire thing. Don't worry too much. Now I'm going to show you how I get to the state. So see, this is the silicon index. Now when I put the silicon index of the digitally designed case, you see the difference if you see between the natural tooth and where my final incisal edge or my tooth should be. I make an entry point through that guide. And here I am injecting composite all over. It doesn't matter if it goes from one tooth to the other. And I'm going to slowly inject and you can see it's filling up that space. Right now, I'm not worried about curing it because the reason, reason I don't cure anything right now is I want every area filled up. Okay. Now, because I have not done the posteriors at this stage, the posteriors are my stops. So this guide fits it completely onto the posteriors without any movement. So nothing rocks. I don't like anything that rocks. I want precision in the work that I do. So you see how it slowly fills up? Yep. And you can enter each and every tooth individually. Sometimes the adjacent tooth also takes it over. Once you've got this, yep. You look out for areas where you see a bubble or something that is missing. You can re-inject there because you yet not cure anything. And then at this stage, you will cure it. And the beauty is because this is clear silicone, you can cure it through the silicone. And this is what happens when you pull it out. Now, see, I have not made any changes. It, I'm doing this real time. So you can actually appreciate, oh, look at this. So all that buildup that I was doing freehand in my earlier cases, you see how easy it is now with that digital technique. And I always use a number 12 to remove the flash. If the flash doesn't come out in that way, then you can use a very thin, you know, composite polishing burr there, something like a, a TC11 or something like that. Uh, once you've done all of that, you remove, see, this is a, this is a, a air bubble that I had in my silicon. It doesn't matter. You know, this I can take care with uh, my, my you know, TC11. Remove all the excess. 
And once I have done all of that, see, this is the end result. Look and appreciate at the tissue. You see how healthy the, the tissue is. This is what I'm doing for the mandibular anteriors. Again, canine to canine only. I do not care about what is happening on the posteriors. I have not got a printed model for that. And I'll show you what I mean by that once I come to my next case. So, you know, you go through that, you finish that, you apply your bond, you go to slightly rush through, and then you cure, and that's the end result. So you've got your vertical dimension, you've got the entire guidance, and all this is done on a digital plane, yeah, with a digital, this, so this is what your anteriors look like. And then you go ahead, do the mandibular anteriors. So this is my protocol, maxillary, mandibular. And then I start doing my posterior. So you see, the entire mouth is now built up in the same technique. So once I had my anteriors, then I did my posteriors. And look at this, canine guidances, occlusion, whatever that you require is all here. You can polish it, you can leave it as it is. It's going to be only there for a short period of time. Don't spend too much time polishing, waste of time but make sure there is nothing on the soft tissue. And look at the reaction of this patient when I finish this case, okay? So I just, I like to take these candid videos, these candid shots, you know, the patient sees this for the first time. You see that twinkle in his eye? That tells me everything, whether he's liked it, he's not liked it. Original, non-original. You see that? That is, that is my, my satisfaction when I go home. He's <laughs> talking to his son who is a dentist, right? Yeah. And look at that. You see that twinkle in his eye. I, I can tell you he's like what he's seeing. And this is still just composite provisional. All right. So let's look at this case now. Uh, how I did the same technique for this case. And this was my first case that I used this technique for. So this is how this patient walked in. She was referred to me by my periodontist. She had actually gone to my periodontist because she fractured a molar and she needed an implant. So my periodontist saw the case and she's, she works with me very uh, you know, closely on many of these full mouth cases. So she immediately said, Akil, I think this is a case meant for you. I will do the implants. I will send the case to you, but I need you to prosthetically look at her. So I sat this patient down, asked her what her complaint was. And she said, look at my teeth, look at how they are. And I, I feel I can't chew properly. I feel, you know, it's completely kind of shrunk in. So this is how she came to me. Look at all the composite work done, all the composite staining on these teeth, completely stained, patchwork dentistry done, left, right, center, everywhere. You notice the deep bite? It's become like a cast who div too, you know. Uh, but this deep bite is because there's loss of vertical. So if you increase the vertical, this deep bite, this class two will become more like a class one. You know, it's a slow process of changing the patient from that skeletal scenario. This is how the patient looks like on the left and right. As you see, there is wear on the teeth. Yeah, and this is that typical class one type where there is wear, there is drop of vertical. As you see, there is no buttressing of bone. So there is no physiological movement of the teeth or supra eruption, which has caused this to compensate. You notice, Every time the patient had wear, sensitivity, the dentists have been doing root canals or whatever and giving crowns on them to avoid the patient. So this is called patchwork dentistry. They're not realizing what the outcome, the final outcome should be. So we use the same technique. Now, what have I used here? I've used a simple cement spatula, all right? So I need something to record that vertical on my scanner. And for that, I need her to be stable, to be biting on something. One way would be, uh, now why am I trying to record her bite at the increased vertical or the so-called ideal vertical that I want to achieve? Is because if I send this information to the lab, the lab can create beautiful you know, teeth for me with the right space which is required, rather than having to increase it in the software. When you do that, unfortunately, softwares don't open. See, this is how your jaw opens, right? So these are your condyles, and this is your anteriors. So teeth open up like this, but in softwares, they open up like this. So I didn't want that discrepancy to be there in my patient. So I want to record this, but at the same time, I want this to be at the right vertical, right? So I get this, I put in this 
Simmons spatula and I keep measuring and all I need to do is keep pushing the Simmons spatula a little because you know the Simmons spatula is thin at the top and they become wider at the uh, towards the uh, handle area right so as you push them in there's an opening and you tell the patient just hold it for me whilst I do my scan so you notice how I have held it and you see that vertical dimension has increased on the posteriors and I need to record this in this position if I was doing analog dentistry I would have squirted a silicon bite registration material here and recorded the bite in this position. So you notice on the scanner, the bite is now an open bite, but this is the right vertical dimension that I want for this particular patient. Yeah, so what I do is I send these scans to the lab. Like I said, all you need is a scanner and then the lab takes over. All right, so this is all happening in the lab. Now you see the wear, you see the teeth, which are got you know, restorations on them. This is the mandibular arch. This is the whole scanning. When I'm scanning, I use a TK for a Trios uh, scanner. And I love this. I'm using it now for the last quarter. Believe me, it my life again. I don't know the last time that I bought any of this bite one. Spatula, but you recorded it in the right vertical. This goes to the lab. Now they have this bite perfectly. Now, also, what you can do if you really want to deprogram this patient, put that spatula, ask the patient to wait in your uh, you know, waiting room for half an hour. Even the CR kind of comes into place. So you're not having to do a lot of work on your CR too. Now, these are pictures that I take, I make notes on them, and I send it to the lab. That's what I meant. You need to be involved with your lab as to what you want. You notice I have, I've written down a few things. I've shown things that, you know, that the negative uh, corridor on the buckle corridor, which is present, I've told them to add over there. So these are my notes because it makes that area look very, you know, uh, pumped, uh, not pumped in. It looks all, you know, collapsed. So the, I'm just, you know, these are pictures that I write and then, you know, green is to add incisally. I want her to get that, you know, smile line. Uh, add labially too because every tooth it seems a little tipped in these are my notes now i like to write my notes on pictures rather than just write it on a piece of paper because they can't visualize you know if i give you things to see and if i'm just you just see my face and i'm trying to explain to you you know add buckley add this but with this picture you see a lot you understand a lot so this is what the lab does on their software they will design but what do I do? How do they send it back to me? We need to print the printer. Do you need a printer? No. You tell your lab to get that printer. Most labs today have the printer. Now I get four models printed. That means two sets. And now I will show you and I'll tell you why. You notice here the posteriors are the natural teeth, what they were in the patient's mouth. This only is the digital bit both upper and lower yeah but the second model has all of them in their digital form can you see you can see that beautiful uh cuspal inclinations and you know anatomy that is also created in the digital form so you remember how i showed you i make the first silicon index so let's look at this how do I make this silicon indexes? These are these, just buy these non-perforated trays. You can do this in your clinic. I do this in my clinic. They don't have to be the most spiffiest, frankiest looking, you know, guides. You just need to transfer that information from that resident model into your patient's mouth. You know, you can spend money and get it made by the lab, but you can buy this product or you can have other products similar to this. This is known as Exaclear, which is a clear silicon. Use that. So what I do is, this is my first model, yeah. I have my tray in which I'm going to inject this silicon material, you know, with your regular guns that you have in your practices. All right, once you've injected, all you do is, you know, you remember how we used to make duplicate dentures. We put the denture into the alginate. The same way you put this model into this silicon, let it set, okay? If you can, you have a vacuum, uh, he pressed uh, what we call cooker in your uh, practice put it in that you will not have these bubbles all right 
And that's how this comes out. Once this comes out, this is how it fits. The model fits into that. This why we want non-perforated because you, you know see that clean, nice uh, you know finish that you get on the outside, and you don't want this to hold. So please don't apply adhesive to, for taking this impression. So now I have my first set. So you have your um, anteriors, and anteriors are recorded in this. You notice these are the original teeth, and you notice these points through which I can put in my uh, you know composite tips yeah the same i do for the mandibular and then i make a same thing for the posteriors now you notice that these tips are here yep so these are for my posteriors right the same way but because my anteriors are stable this little you know silicon index fits in very perfectly like fits in like a jigsaw puzzle things don't move this was my first case so i did only half half I was not sure, so I removed all the old composite that she had on her teeth and, you know, sandblast, etch, bond, and just inject, right? You've seen how I do it now, uh, you know, faster. So I do the entire canine to canine in one shot. Once you've done that, I do my posteriors. Now I want to bring to your notice that, you know, this was being my first case, you notice that the shades of these composites are all different because I was not sure of how much composite or flowable composite will I require for a case like this. Now we worked it out. So we have, we always keep flowable composite in stock. But at that time it was like desperate, you know, whatever you have, bring it on. See, these are mistakes everybody makes. You know, I'm human. I'm no some, I'm no some god or I'm not some, you know, Marvel superhero, which uh, who's always going to be perfect, right? So I'm, I'm another human, so I made these mistakes, that's okay. Then do a complete bite adjustment, occlusal adjustment needs to be done. So what are the occlusal adjustments that you need to do? You need to adjust your centric stops, yeah? You need to lateral guidance, try and get your canine guidance and don't forget your anterior guidance. That means your forward backward movement too, yeah? Once you've got that, this is what you achieve. Now you want to prep these, right? You want to prep these, these, this is your first, like I said, your working model splint, your working model guide. Patient goes home with this. I let the patient be at least minimum four weeks or more with this. They chew, they do what they want with this. Tell them no nuts. Other than that, you can eat everything. And I tell them, go break this and come back. They look at my face. What do you mean go break it? I said, do what you want to. As long as you don't open bottles with this, you don't open things, you know, like, uh, you know, lace packets and stuff like that with your mouth. You eat everything possible except cracking a walnut in your mouth. They go, oh, all right, that's good. They go home so happy because you see, you saw the reaction of that patient that I showed you, right? He is ready to eat right away because the composite is cured. Right now, if this was a temporary or a provisional material, which most people use, you know, things like pro temp, luxa temp, they convert it. You can't, you, if you don't prep your tooth, that material breaks. All right. Now, please do this only if your patient is committed. If the patient is not committed and you just want to show them, like, you know, to gain their trust, then do it in pro temp because that you can remove or a luxa temp or any of those kind of materials. Yeah. But here, my patient was already committed. So I converted into this. So, what are the indices now? Once I start prepping this teeth, I need to make indices, right? I mean, to make provisionals. So I use the clear silicon index, which I already have. You can use a new PVS, you know, index. You take a new impression and use that. Okay. People, you know, know you can use an alginate impression, but I'm not a big fan of alginate impression for a case like this. Because when you use it for a case like this, you could have, you know, things which warp and things don't fit in. So I've started with my crown preps. And as you can see, I've converted my crown preps, these uh, composites, this is composite, this is composite, and this is protein. Yeah, you can see how I've converted one to the other. And now I take my scans. Now, even when I take my scans, please appreciate that there is a double cord technique. Scan does not mean you can get away from your gingival retraction, okay? This is how I scan. This is how it works. Now, you notice that I have not prepped my posteriors. The reason I have left my molars is because they are my vertical stops. They determine my vertical stops. Indication tight. I don't lose my vertical that I worked on so hard. So hard for. Right? And you also notice on the upper left side, we had an implant placed there. 
So the implant is still healing, and we are not going to do the implant prosthesis at this stage. We'll wait for that to you know go through because you needed a sinus lift, so you need to wait for that, right? These are my preps. These are my models. Once these models were made, these are all resin models. Believe me, my friends, you are not doing this. This is the lab doing all of this. And this is also not the lab doing. There's a software which helps them do this. It is so much faster and more accurate. All they need to do is mark the margin and the software automatically reduces this and it gives it to them. So we, as typically being a prosthodontist, I use, like to use my semi-adjustable articulator. I did my phase four. Today, I don't do them because we're using another technique, which I'll show you uh, later. So... We've gone digital in that too. So I have got my semi-adjustable articulator mounted. And you know that entire thing that the, that the lab had made for me earlier, they just do a cut, copy, paste. If I have made changes to those provisionals, I found them too long, too short, or what are all any, I, all I need to do is a scan of that, send it to them. They reorient that onto the, so aesthetics becomes, so you are, you are the artist who is going to give you give this patient everything, right? See, I believe as dentists, like they always say, you know, we are uh, we have a, a scope of science, but we have more of art in us. And if we have that art, and you've got you know things organized, so all your knowledge that you have about aesthetic dentistry, put it into your provisionals, and then take a scan and send it off. The lab then converts it. These are. Emacs vineyard or lithium disilicate vineyard. So they milled my, uh, you know, Emacs CAD. So they milled my copings and on that veneering was done. Once these were bonded, okay, then I started with my posterior. Okay. So now my vertical dimension is not broken. My guidance is not broken. My anterior guidance is not lost. At the same time, my posteriors are done. Now once, And you notice the very little preparation I made on that posterior molar because for the increase of vertical dimension. I basically just created a margin and you know just what we call a <coughs> uh, area for the crown to fit onto, just enough reduction. Now the top molar gave up on us when I was doing this and I sent her back to the periodontist for another implant. So there were two implants to this bit, but I wanted to complete all the others just to see how. The design thing is done. As you can see, there are different, this is how we finished bonding. Now was the waiting period for those implants to heal. And once the implants were healing, so this is the first set of bonding maxilla mandible and then once the implant healed now we also scan these uh, I'll show you how we do it so you get the emergence profile you get uh, when for the tissue you run for any customization on the tissue we scan the mandible arch now you see Emergence profile of the tissue is also scanned. So you don't really need a tissue model here. The lab already has this. So this is not difficult. You know, people might be seeing this and thinking, oh my god, how am I gonna do it? These are scan bodies. These are scan bodies which, uh, which help you to record the position of the implant in the patient's mouth. And any or most companies nowadays give you these scan bodies. These were biohorizon implants, so the biohorizon scan Now, what I want you all to appreciate here is can I type, I can record that too for my digital scan. Now, this kind of record of scan motion is only possible with as far as knowledge goes, it might be now that other companies are continuing, but I like to record this send it off to the lab because the lab can then give me crowns which have no interferences, right? No lateral interferences. Especially on an implant crown, because an implant crown lateral interferences which has got the implant to 100 percent weight. So this is what was sent across. This is the designing. And we kept them two individual crowns, which is two excess holes for them. So these can be made in open dietetic. Now the designing has been done. The designing 
everything is done, everything is done. And this is how we screw them in. Once you screw them in, we put in the PTFE tape and we seal it with composite. And this is the end result for the maxillary arch. And this is the whole case finished. So you notice how we create the surface texturing in the anteriors. Also notice how well the tissue has healed, the stippling on the tissue, which tells me that the tissue is healthy. So these were my crown preps on which we had my, uh, you know, restorations. This is how we finished. And this is her post her treatment. So this is how we started and this is how we finished. Before, and after. So let me go through this case. So what did I do? I took pictures, I took scans, I sent it to the lab, they did the digital designing, they sent it back to me with models, two sets of models, right? Anteriors and then anteriors and posteriors both together. I made that silicon index, I converted it into her mouth, let her go for minimum four weeks. If you want more, you can ask them to stay more. These things don't break, so you don't have to worry about temporaries falling out or provisionals coming away. Patient traveling, very important. They can travel with it. Come back when they are happy. You have to make adjustments. You do it. It's like adjusting a splint. You adjust this composite. Once they come back, you start prepping teeth. Now, you want to go slow. Do the anteriors first. Take impressions of that or a scan. Uh, send it to the lab. Finish the anteriors. Then do the posteriors. Today, I have slowly mastered it and I've also found techniques of how to maintain the vertical where I also prep the posteriors. I do the entire arch on one day, okay? So slowly. Now I'm coming to the second case where I've done the entire digital planning for a full mouth implant case, okay? I hope people are not getting too intimidated with the kind of uh, you know workflow that I'm giving, but believe me again in this case, I have done only the clinical bit, but I will show you what I have used from other labs as a jump to what I have done. So this is all teamwork, my friends. This is not one man army. Akil Reshamwala alone cannot do this. And if I realize this the earlier, the sooner, the better it is for me, all right? So this is what we did. This is how this patient walked into my practice. Very close friend's uncle. And he says, Akil, you do what you want. He's had this problem from a very, very long time. So I'm just going to quickly shock you with what was in his mouth. Believe me, when I say this, I'm sorry I'm making your Sunday morning very gross, you know, but when he used to walk in, we used to actually know that he's walked in because we could smell it. You know, the entire perio issues were so bad. These were all periodontally compromised. You look at the angulations of what am I going to do for this? I had no place to start with. I didn't know whether to, you know, to save some, to not save some. The first thing I said, please go for an OPG, get an OPG. And then we decided, all right, you know, we had a long conversation. I said, I would be able to do few things here and there for you, but we'll not be able to get them perfect. So are you okay if I sacrifice? He says, Akil, I trust you. You do what you want. These are all periodontally compromised, one degree, two degree mobility. So we decide to, Extract, look at this, look at his bite. Where do I start? What do I start with? And believe me, my friends, the vertical dimension is perfect. Okay, so we are in a situation where I can't do anything in vertical dimension or anything of that sort. This is the situation in the mouth. He's not even wearing a denture. He's not, he's, at, he's been living like this. He's been living like this for all his time. So we do a clean slate, but I only extract, I don't do any alveoplasty at that time because I do not want to lose any bone. If I'm looking at implants, I want all the bone possible to be present in his mouth. I will decide later if I need to lose it. Now, you can see how healthy the tissue is, but you can see there are like these kind of tori on his uh, ridges. So that's not going to help us with our implant placement. Now, when we have a case like this, the first thing that normally we would do is make a denture, make a denture, put markers on them, send it off for CBCT uh, scan, 
bring the scan back, then decide where your implants are, you know, make judgments analog and then open up freehand. Okay, do we need a sinus lift? Do you need this? All of that is decided on the scan. But what I normally do is this. So you see, there is a huge tori in the mandible. Now, let me go a little bit into implant dentistry and tell you what, 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 what I mean by FP1, FP2, and FP3. So my game, my game plan is I want an FP1 prosthesis for the upper arch, and I want an FP2 prosthesis for the mandibular arch. Reason I want an FP2 for the mandible is the presence of this tori. I cannot see because here in this region, there is a lot of vertical loss as compared to this region. So if I have to keep this flat across, this ends up into an FP2. But this was more or less straight. So I can get away with an FP1 here. Yeah. So if you do not understand FP1 and FP2, FP1 is where you only show white. That means there is no gingival tissue. There is no gingival tissue in the prosthesis. FP2 is where you might require a little level of gingival tissue. FP3 is where you require a good height of what we call teeth as well as gingival tissue. Now, what is FP1? What are you looking at the height? Now, if I have to calculate vertical dimension here, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a minimum of 10 to 11, 11.5 11 for an FP1 because I'm going to place my implants in such a way that my tooth emergence profile comes out that way. I'm going to scallop these so that I get the right aesthetics in an FP1. I don't want even that interdental pink to show. Then I've lost it. The whole aesthetics is lost, right? Whereas in an FP2, I need minimum 12 to 15. So these are, I can share a lot of articles with you all on vertical dimensions and how you adjust all of that. I'm not going too much into the depth here because of time constraints. Yeah, we just have another half an hour to go and I want to finish this case before the moderators tell me to go home, you know. So this is how, after I had extracted, we made him a simple denture, back rim plate, with only anteriors, canine to canine placed. That would determine what my vertical as well as my aesthetics. With this protocol of photographs, we send the intraoral scan. So this is the iOS scan, iOS scan. One second. iOS scan. And this is the uh, scan of the denture. And you can see the denture teeth in that. Yeah, there's a scan of the denture. Both are superimposed on the software. Please do not get intimidated. I repeat, do not get intimidated because this is not your job. This is your lab's job. Okay, the lab does this. You don't have to get, you know, oh my God, what is all this? How can I, how will I manage? All you're doing is sending the teeth setup and a scan or an impression of your ridges that is all just like what you did for a complete denture in your practice for years together so i repeat and i repeat and i repeat don't get intimidated by this all right so this is the new setup now i had sent facial pictures i had sent the intraoral scan and i had sent the cbct scan to my lab so cbct is done at the center if you have a, your own cbct machine you can send that dicom files again i repeat no intimidation. You need impression or a scan of the intraoral, and you need the setup on the anterior. These three information, four information you send to the lab, the lab creates this for you. Okay. They can print this digital denture and send it back to you. And I will show you how we do it. So they even can get the occlusion right in that digital denture. Now, what the lab had done also was superimposed it onto the CBCT. So you know how this is what the space would look like if the teeth were in this position. Are my teeth on the ridge? Are they away? Do I need grafting? Do I need to this? Now in his case, he had a very pneumatic sinus. All right. So this information I send, I'm sure you must have all heard of Professor or Dr. Aruna Chilam. He runs a center which is known as click to scan Click to scan is a center where you can send all this information. They design a guide for you with your approvals. Okay. So what I have done here is you can see I have sent the markers. You can see those markers over here. 
on your um, denture that I had fabricated, the di digital denture. All right, so you just put some GP points, take a CBCT, send it to them. So those markers, you can see, you can see them on this, right? Now, once you've done that, you send that to them and this is how they do the planning. So I'll show you a very quick, so this is the CBCT. You see those markers as, as those dots in the middle, right? Then they superimpose your denture, that digital denture, their scan, because the CBCT also need, need the double scan, right? So you need the scan of your denture as well as of your uh, bone. And now your intraoral scan is also superimposed here. You see how beautifully digital dentistry is created my patient outside my patient. You can see the nerve openings. You can see now what they're doing, the teeth, which I had given them that, okay, I want this position, right? Which were also digitally designed are also superimposed. Now, once I have that, you notice they can on the cross section area here, you notice you can see the tooth position and where the implants are going to go. So here in this case, we kept the posteriors tilted because we don't, didn't want to do sinus slips and make the patient wait for you know all the sinus lift procedure wait. So we went tilted. We decided to give 30 degree multi-units, whereas the anteriors with 17 degrees. So these are, this is my 1.6, my 1.4, my 1.1 or 1.2, sorry. See, you, they show you every implant and where it goes in, which is my position. It's so beautifully, completely surrounded by bone. Now, when I go freehand, I may or may not get it. Good surgeons will get it. I am not saying that you won't. You can get this effect even with a good surgeon. But to be precise, I need something. So I can go back and back and forth and back and forth. And can we change this position? Can we change that position? We talk. They do it for me. Now, these are the anchor pins. Now, this is the three pins with which my guide will fit onto this bony structure. All right. So, this is pin one, pin two, pin three. Nothing is coming in the way. That is what we're checking over here. The thing comes in the way of these uh, pins because they are my anchor pins. Anchor meaning they will hold my guide in position whilst I'm doing my surgery. So, you see, this is the mandibular arch now. In the mandibular arch, we managed to get all six perfectly aligned. Like literally they are like straight as, right? So you can parallel them. Now, you know, when you're doing a implant over denture and if you get one implant like this and the other like that, then one which is like this is come always this. All this can be done with a guide. Use digital technique to make them parallel to. You may be an amazing surgeon and you may be getting them spot on too. I'm not saying no to that. But if you can use something and make sure predictability is the key point here. You notice all these, how these implants are all in position, everything, but the 4-2, watch out for the 4-2. I was warned that it is a thin bone, but you try and place this implant. Yeah, the 4-2 implant. I'll show you what happened when it came to the surgical part. Now, you notice that that tori is also there. You can see the incisive, incisive canal here. So, you know, you can avoid all of this. Now, this is what they fabricate. That same denture has a guide or a jig which fits into your base, which is known as a scaffold base. And I'll show you what it looks like. This is what a scaffold base looks like. So, this is what gets anchored onto my bone first. And every other guide just goes like a jigsaw puzzle back into this. So, these, these regions here that you see, those three little studs, they are what will hold all my guides one over another. Okay. Now, this is how you place your, this I'll show you in the entire surgery. Now, I wanted an FP1. So, I wanted that nice good scallop, right? Remember, the scallop that you get on your anteriors. This is a bone trimming guide for scallop. You see this? We take a burr and we can scallop the tissue because the tissue will follow the bone. If my bone is scalloped, the tissue will come, come out scallop. So we did this once we've done that as per the, so now because we had those teeth already placed in, we could do this accordingly. Freehand, you can't do this. Yeah. Now I want my six implants in place. So this is my implant guide. You notice the pink guide did not move, that the scaffold did not move. All the others just went in, went out. 
and these are my multi units all coming into the uh, towards the lingual of the anteriors nothing coming out buccally all placed so we had 17 degrees on the anterior four multi units and you had 30 degrees for your posterior two because they were tilted this is for the maxillary arch maxillary arch complete look at this and they we had also made a prosthesis a prosthesis an immediate provisional can also be made but in this case we couldn't use that because we had an issue and i will show it to you when we are doing the surgery there's a surgery video coming up so i'll show that to you too during that stage and then all you do is put this on inject some composite into this open spaces where the multi units are pick it up and boom you have delivered the provisional on the same day now ideally i used to take a whole day to do this where i used to do denture pickups and all of that today i finish a case like this in less than an hour and a half to two hours max and i'm talking talking to the patient bringing the patient in making them sit on the chair upper and lower there were times when i used to do only one arch because the patient would get too tired to do a, a case like that so this is the lower arch again you index your scaffold base now here the bone trimming is slightly different because we are doing an fp2 why are we doing an fp2 because the fourth quadrant is way too lower than the third and the anterior zone so this is my bone trimming guide that we fabricate you take a burr and it just go so you see how we leveled out you see the fourth quadrant being lowest that is what we've taken as our base and the rest we are going to just knock it off you see with the different colors you can see all the different parts that go in this is what we do a bone trimming guide to flatten the ridge and that is why the intaglio surface of your implant prosthesis always has to be convex and not concave if this concave you have food food lodgement so notice this is the implant guide but watch out for my 42 remember the 42 and i'll show you what i did with my 42 right but it also helps me at least get my pilot drills now this is an index which i can put in back on so that it helps me how do i correlate the lower to the upper the patient is numb i can't ask him to bite to get the occlusion right so this is the guide that i will use to help me get my occlusion right for the lower prosthesis like i said unfortunately we didn't get to use them but it's okay to share and you can see it so these are your multi unit cylinders on which you do the pickup so this is your prosthesis which you do the pickup for all you can do is squeeze pro tem squeeze you know your uh, what we call the composite flowable composite there's a material from breedent known as q resin which i like a lot because that q resin is really solid and it's light cured so when it goes it doesn't crack or it doesn't break or you know composite sometimes can be too weak such a thick layer of composite it can be a little weak in a situation like this so these are pmma mill that means they are what polymethyl methacrylate mill so the composites sometimes don't even completely bond to it it's just a mechanical retention that's why i like to use that q resin because q resin is also acrylic component in it and is a bond which you can apply so you notice the upper and the lower yeah now this is how the models were made so they gave me printed models with where my implants will end up being yeah this is the digital denture which again they have printed again please don't worry you don't worry about these are it's like a jigsaw puzzle right they give you step 1 step 2 step 3 they can actually show you a whole you know guide system where uh, you can uh, you know they send you a complete sheet with which you can follow i'll just see if i can get that for you uh this is the digital guide can you get me that sheet thank you and this is the scaffold which gets attached to it now this is my implant guide on my left this is the implant guide and this is my scallop guide yeah and now after post scalloping what would be my situation of bone in the patient's mouth is this is the printed model for that too this is my mandibular arch you notice it has been you know trimmed this is the mandibular mandibular digital denture which has these things to which you attach the scaffold guide and you then anchor it into the patient's mouth 
And then this is your bone trimming guide, this is the bone trimming guide, and this is your implant guide. All this jigsaw fits in together like this before you start. Okay, so you put the scaffold guide. So you have one scaffold guide to your upper digital denture in occlusion with your lower digital denture, and fourth, the scaffold guide for the lower. You put this entire thing into the patient's mouth onto the lintulus uh, jaw. So what happens? The patient gets into the right bite, the right position. Once you've got this right, my friends, nothing can stop you from getting this spot on. Okay. So this is how it looks like in the patient's mouth. Everything placed in, bite perfect. Okay. Uh, you can also have a silicone bite, but I don't like those silicone bites because you can't sometimes see through. You notice this material for the resin uh, digital denture is, uh, no, I need that big sheet. Uh, uh, the, uh, the digital denture is that I can see through and I can see that bite. Yeah. Oopsie. Sorry. All right. So this is the surgery. Like I showed you, these are all the models that came in pre surgery. I'm injecting. I'm going to rush through the injection bit so we don't waste time. So you need to inject because you're going to reflect a full flap here. Uh, I'm not a very big fan of going flapless because I've done flapless and I've had a lot of issues. And I'll tell you why in this case, not doing a flapless, flapless actually helped me. So these are my guides. You notice, you see, I showed, I told you, this is how it goes into the patient's mouth making sure that the patient bites in perfectly. At this stage, I'm even injecting the mandibular, but only on the buckle. Now I'll tell you why, because this is something, it's a very good tip which Dr. Arunachalam gave me. And he told me, Akil, get the lowers and get their anchor pins perfect, because later on, you may not be able to ask the patient to bite because they'll be completely numb, they might be hurting. So what we do is we put the upper and lower in together. And trying to show you all that it completely seats. You, you see, because of the transparency of this material, I can see it's actually seated on the ridge. And then you have a guide kit and you have drills specific for this. Again, every company, whichever you use, will provide you with these guide kits. This is an Austin uh, implant that I have used. So I'm checking if my anchor pin is going in there. So what I do is first, Drill all your three anchor uh, holes. Once you've done that, and you know, and don't ask the, tell your patient, don't open the mouth, all right? Because stability is the biggest, biggest, most important thing here. Yeah. Now I go in for the mandibular too. Here I have not reflected the flap. So you will have three little holes later on, but that's okay, that you can manage. The heel, you know, any which way heel over. So this is my anchor pin. Now I'm going to reflect the flap. Now here, the only uh, trick is you need to reflect really high. Why is because all these things they come up right out of the bony ridge. So you need to really reflect high. Once you reflected high enough, then you place all of this into the mouth again. So you, you realize all those guides are out of the mouth, but you see those three little holes are there on the maxilla, as well as they will be there on the mandible. I noticed there was something missing on that area when I was reflecting. You saw I removed some little bit of bone from there. Now, there was no grafting done for him. It was only pure extractions and nothing else. I'm gonna just go through this quickly. You really go high. Now, what I notice here is soft bone. Yeah. And I start digging in and suddenly I notice, whoops, there is a big area. And I'm worried whether my guide will fit, will not fit, but just see the accuracy of this, this guide. So I start scraping away. This must have been, you know, some residual perio infection, which I forgot to remove. I don't know. These are things, like I say, I'm, I'm a human being. Um, so I put those things back in the mouth, but this time my tissue is reflected. My flap is reflected, right? 
I'm just making sure that the you know those things are patent. So I'm re-entering re them, and you notice how I have getting my on the slow hand speed, uh, slow speed uh, setting of your implant setting. You go in with your anchor pins. They actually go in and they clamp in, and boom, you stop, you pull it out. You go in, boom, stop, pull it out. You saw. Now you pull out that digital guide. There is no new, no use for the digital denture anymore. I'm making sure that my entire thing is nicely reflected. Only at this stage will I reflect my palatal because if I reflect my palatal, the denture won't see it. Are you understanding why I'm doing this? Only buckle first and then later on palatal. So now once I have that palatal done, you see the bone and this is my implant guide going into place. So you might have issues like in this case, I had to, you know, add a little more for my uh, incision to make sure that there is more tissue because it was very tight, very taut. You notice the tissue is really thick in this patient's uh, case. And this is the burr, the crestotomy burr that I use. And then all you do is just go in and this is my scalloping. This is my scallop guide. Yep. So I, did, I do my scalloping before I place my implants. Because post implant placement, if I touch that head with the burr, I might damage the implant head. And that's not something that I want to do. Here, I make a mistake, I'm still okay. Always make sure that you have that space for making a mistake. You know, you have a reverse gear in your car. You don't have only forward because if you only go forward, you can crash into something, but how do you get out from that? Right? So this is my scalloping being done. Once I have done all the scalloping, I shall remove this guide and you notice the scallops on the bony surface. So that is why FP1, I wanted that scallop to give it a nice good soft tissue emergence profile. I'm making it a little bit more nicer once I've removed it, you can sculpt it, right? So you use a little bit of your common sense and do that. But how would I know where to do this if I didn't have the guide? Yeah. Now this is my implant guide and this is I'm using my first drill, second drill. I'll go through a series of drills. Again, all this comes out in a printed format from your software. It actually tells you step one, step two, step three. And I'll show you what I mean uh, by what comes through. You notice these are my angulated implants. I am not worried right now about the sinus about anything because all that I have taken care of. The, uh, my friends, this is real time. As you see, how fast I'm drilling through. So I pick up one drill, I go through one, two, three, four, five, six. If the implant size is the same, when I need to stop or you know there's a change of towards the final drill, those are the only times that I make you know corrections to what I what I'm doing. You notice now the final drill in any kind of surgery like this. Please don't go the entire length. Just go a little bit and stop. This is my implant. And my implant going in. Now you see this little, uh, you know, like a square tab uh, on the buckle, right? I'm supposed to get that yellow, which is the hex indication parallel to that. Yeah. This is my second implant going in. All this is real time. So you see how easy I have not removed that guide. I'm just going in and making sure. Yeah, that's it. Move to the next one. All I need to do is make sure that those things match. You see the yellow line and that uh, rectangular hex or the rectangular block on the buckle. That is also predetermined by my software. Click to scan had given me this as an option. Dr. Priyanka there does this. She's a radiologist. She does this planning for me. And of course, in coordination with Dr. Arunachalam and myself. So we keep talking to each other. Once all of that is done, This is my final one. I find that is, this is not 100% stable, but it's okay. Because you remember that bone loss there? 
But yet, because I had the guide, I could get the implant in the right position. Now, if you were going freehand in an area which has a little bit of buckle bone loss, you would always miss the spot. You would always go, you know, haywire. These things hold so perfect. The guides help you get everything spot on. So here I'm using that mirror to tell me where the, you know, hex is going to be. This is my implants placed in. You notice there is no buckle wall here. So I'm just slightly hand talking it to make sure it's primary stable. We got good stability, but there is a missing buckle wall. So we, we decide to graph that area. But what I'm doing here is placing all my multi-units first. These are my 17 degrees multi-units. They go into place. Slightly, sometimes you need to adjust. So now Ostrom has come out with a new device which actually you put on and just go boom, and it takes away all that excess bone. So I have already received that for my onward cases. We're going to use that. Now this is my hand talking device which I use. So I set my talk onto it, make sure that these are already talked, finally talked. I'm not going to touch them ever in this patient's life. You notice how all of them are getting more or less parallel. Getting them 100% parallel is difficult, but guided will help you. So this is even my last implant where it goes in. You see, we're getting more or less parallel. And then I place my uh, healing caps on them because I want to suture everything. And then once I've placed all of that in, so what I decide to do is I don't decide to put the healing cap for the posterior one because I'm going to graph there. And then all my anchor pins come out. So you put your, uh, you know, physio dispenser in the implant reverse mode, same speed as implant forward, and you unscrew this. You don't go in a very fast mode because you can damage the bone there. So it's a slow process, but a very precise process. So once you've done all of that, all your scaffold guides and all of that come out. Now we take some autogenous bone from the anterior nasal spine area. We're collecting it so that you know we can use that for our grafting. And we do a little bit of bone regeneration there. So we place your autogenous first, and on top of this, we use xenograft, a mix of xeno and auto. Please uh, forgive the speed of this video because of time constraints. I don't want to go too much into the detailing of this. But yeah, if you are in a course with me, I will probably have it at the same regular speed and we can talk about everything there. I don't, don't want to get into topics which I'm not touching today. So we have the membrane place. So that was the situation earlier. This is what we grafted and then we close over. So unfortunately, because of this bone loss and because we were grafting and we didn't get a very good primary stability on that implant, we decided to not load. And that is my biggest regret to this case, but it's okay. These are things that happen. So here I am. Or here we are sculpting the tissue to, you know, hold on to the healing abutment, uh, healing caps. This actually is my periodontist as well. This is uh, Dr. Shunipade who's doing this work. And like I said, teamwork. It's all about teamwork. We get a closure. So you do a double, you know, Double layered suturing, get this closure on the grafted area. So you saw there is a bony protuberance which was causing that excess bone. We don't require, so we trim it away. So that we get proper full closure. Once all of that is done, suturing and boom, it's over. Okay. So that's the maxillary arch. This is how quickly to show you how we had planned our implants. Coming to the mandibular arch, I'm not going to show the video of this, but I'll just quickly show you some pictures. So this is my first anchor uh, scaffold guide, which goes in, right? Once the scaffold guide goes in, you can very clearly see this is my bone trimming guide. Yep. Now, when you see it at 
a straight on angle, you can actually see all the excess bone, which is above that trimming guide. So all I need to do is pick up a burr and flatten it out to that height. Once I've done that, I get a nice good flat and you can actually see you level it completely out. Now this becomes your table for where your implants go in. Yep. To this, I place my implant guide. Once I place my implant guide, one, two, three. Okay. We go in with our uh, drills. So here, remember the 4-2 I had told you uh, we had issues because it was narrow. So what I did there was I picked up my Densa bar and I did some outside densification freehand, but I had the path. The first two drills which went in had given me the path of where I want to. I did also uh, also densification, widen the uh, bone uh, bony ridge there, and then I placed my implant there. So these are my implants, the mandibular ones in position, suturing done, and this is the end result on the same day at the same time post the surgery. All done in a matter of less than two hours. Yeah, all precise, all good. Now we wait for things to heal. So today we are at a stage where we are now scanning him again for his prosthesis because uh, uh, you know prosthesis they are ready to load the implants are ready to load. What you saw earlier were the multi units which you have to scan first. On top of that, these are the scan bodies for multi units. People thought only you have uh, you know like uh, scan bodies for implant level ones. Now you have it for multi unit also. So once you have placed your multi units, you don't touch them, and all you do is scan over them. Send this information to the lab. So now all this information goes to the lab. Along with this, the lab has my first planning that they have done. They're going to start superimposing everything. So this is my lower uh, scan bodies. So today what we are doing using. Another digital computer. We scan the patient's face. The provisional in his mouth. The dentist that we had made. Right? The dentist that we had made. First, we do a face scan. How do we believe this? The camera lines and all of that. So you have this marker that you place in the base of the you write on it. You notice, you know, this is what I meant by we don't use face bows now because now this is digitally transferred for the patient. So, with this, people, I would like to say, my friends, I would like to say that I, I still am working on the prosthetics of this. Uh, I haven't yet completed this case. But I wanted to share it with you uh, because I want you all to see how the entire surgical phase or this entire surgical uh, aspect of this patient became so easy because we digitally planned everything for this case. Yep. So nothing happens in my practice without my team. And I thank my team as always, um, uh, big time. Uh, before I go on to my next one, is I want to share with you all, or I would like to show you, remember I told you, you get a, uh, how do I focus on this? Uh, I'm not getting it. I'll try and send it to you all. This is like a sheet, okay, which comes in from the lab and they send it to us and it gives you a complete detailed thing of step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, boom. I don't use my brains. I just follow it blindly because all, all that I have done, I've already done in the planning stage. So I don't know how many people of y'all have heard about this Nürburgring. Nürburgring is a place where it's called the green, uh, uh, green hell or the ring of death. And this is a place, it's actually a racetrack and a racetrack where people go to drive cars. And unfortunately, why is it called the green, uh, green hell or the, ring of death is because there have been a lot of deaths there for racers. So I, before the pandemic started, I went there and unfortunately, so on that day, the weather was amazing to start with, but as you see, within an hour's time, the weather became like this. And when the weather became like this, and then we had snow, 
So they shut down the racetrack and I was very upset because I had actually traveled all the distance to go and drive one day. This is one of my dreams which I want to do, like, you know, bucket list. And I couldn't do it. And uh, I had to come back home saying, you know, but now, nah, you know me, I find my ways around things. So the next day, so this was my car that I was supposed to drive. As you can see, the snow on that bonnet there, and you can see the car ready for me to go. And of course, I did get to drive her, and she's a race prepped M2. Uh, I did get to drive her, but I was still not you know, happy. So what I did was I became like a janitor the next day. I went to clean up the, I took a job to clean up the Nürburgring and see, this is what I did. be the only one waiting for this digital technology to hit you. This was me when I got my digital technology and I started going berserk. So from, you know, that first video that I showed you where in the analog world where parking a car was so difficult. When you go into the digital world, you can start driving like this gentleman who just did. It wasn't me. With that, I would like to say a very big thank you to everybody, everybody who uh, you know, took out time on a Sunday to, you know, come listen to me. Uh, if you all have, I know you all will have a lot of questions. I know you all will have a lot of doubts. But uh, please don't hesitate to connect with me on any of these, uh, you know, media. Uh, I'm on Insta, I'm on WhatsApp. You can always email me your uh, questions. And uh, yes, I do run a lot of courses. So if you want to get on to them, connect with me, I will, uh, you know, help you with it. I think I'm most active right now on Insta. So, you know, please feel free to connect with me on Insta. Uh, and once again, I would like to thank the IDA branch of Thiruela and in total Kerala for allowing me to share these cases that I do in my small little practice in a city of Nami, Mumbai. And uh, thank you very much, sir, all of you all. 
and uh, the ladies also uh, who are listening to me today. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akil, sir. It was a very informative section. I am sure this digital technology would be of immense benefit in our practice, especially in a world where we don't use face for no need of taking impressions, etc. So, sir, there are many questions flooding up in our uh, Zoom chat box and also in our YouTube chat box. So, the, with your permission, can we move on to question and answer section, sir? Yes, of course, ma'am. I am going to try and get more people to be seen over here so I can actually talk to them. In, in, uh, if we can, uh, the moderators can switch to that, you know, the big screen of that would be nice. I don't know how to do it from here. Akil, sir, can I go ahead with the first question on those. the Zoom chat box, sir? Yeah. Yeah. You want me to open the chat box? No, no, I will take it for you. So you can answer the questions. Okay. All right. Uh, so Dr. Smriti asks, uh, during the composite temporization, how is the cervical margin of the teeth taken care of? Uh, the cervical margins of the teeth are already designed in the digital, uh, you know, printed model. So they don't touch it. If in, in the case that I showed you, I didn't have any crown lengthening to be done. Uh, if I needed crown lengthening, I would do that before I do the uh, composite buildups uh, on my that silicone guide. So already the tissue is healed and then the same, because it is so precise, we can make a, a crown lengthening guide, then give you the silicone guide and then nothing would matter as far as the tissue goes. The tissue is my... If you realize the kind of attention I pay to tissue, I really like my tissue to be healthy all the time because, uh, you know, I remember as a student, the perio department was always considered like, ah, okay, you have to do only scaling. But, but with private practice, and I, uh, and I say with all due respects to every periodontist here, uh, in this group here and to everybody else, that it is a very, very important aspect of a full mouth rehab case. So please, that's a very valid and a very good question. But the, the designer, the digital designer has already merged it perfectly to the soft tissue before he sends you that uh, resin model. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question, how does the designing ensure the occlusal plane is taken care of? You saw the face scan that I did in my last case. Uh, yes, that helps because with that face scan, uh, very soon I will have videos on that too. We can actually uh, correct the occlusal plane to the camper, the electric, yes, whichever you feel comfortable. That software allows you to do it. So this software basically came from the original uh, developers of Medit, the Medit scanner. So they know this, they are, you know, there are, a lot of prosthodontists and probably dentists involved in designing this and they help you to determine that and you have that option of doing a trial run in the patient's mouth just like we do for denture setups right if you don't like that angle of where the occlusion pain is we change it so we can again take pictures send it to the lab or you can actually adjust it with a regular birth as long as you get them in the right plane you record it take a scan again send it to the lab they will make the changes Okay, sir. Uh, so after you prep for the final prosthesis, your provisionals yes. will be in pro temp or in flowable composites? Pro temp, pro temp, because okay. flowable composite won't be strong enough. And now, see, I don't have a waiting period, right? I can, I, I just need that pro temp for the time till I finished all my preps and then I have to take my scan. So it's a very short period. The pro temp in the mouth, which is a porous material at times, is short there is less you know that tissue inflammation you there is less things breaking so i keep that so the whole working model is actually my composite then i'm only converting it like a you know like a quick single crown that we make for our uh, endo treated teeth we take an index before we make the we do the preparation it's like that so you keep it simple also my suggestion to people would be try and keep those joint 
but use a metal disc to open the interdental area. You know, you have to buy these proper double-sided metal discs. Most labs, if you connect with them, they will help you with it. I get mine from my lab. I just call them. My, my disc is blunt and they send me a new one. They hardly cost you, but use that actually. So I spend more time on my provisionals than I actually spend on my preps because preps over the years now have become very easy for me, but getting that tissue right, there should be no gap. There should be no open margin. There should be no excess tissue. There should be no pro temp actually impinging onto the papilla area. That is a tricky part. The papilla area, the papilla once goes up, then for the tissue to come back is very difficult. Here, I would like to share with you Professor Tarnow's uh, article where he says that your contact point between two provisional or two permanent crowns should be exactly 5 mm from your bone in the interdental area. So you get that papilla coming through. So it's a it's a classic article by Professor Dennis Tana. Please refer to that. And that is how I do my provisions. Thank you, sir. And uh, what is the bird that you have used for creating the scallop uh, in the full mouth implant case, sir? That's a crestotomy bird from Comet. All right. Thank you, sir. The next question from Rahul Das is uh, how to give a temporary denture for a full mouth implant case after the surgical procedure? Okay, so there was a time when I used to make dentures. Uh, we moved on from that, as you saw that I made the PMMA framework, but I will explain to you how we do denture. Is you make a regular denture before you've done the surgery. Once you've done your surgery, you place your multi-units. Please do not connect a denture directly to implant level. The implant will fail. Okay, so because the forces work differently. Correct the angulations. Put your multi-unit uh, sleeves, temporary sleeves on. And before you do that, I have an entire series where I can show you. Before you do that, so wherever the multi-units are, in your, uh, on the base of your denture, you can inject a silicon bite registration material and just put it into the patient's mouth. This denture will not fit. But what it will show you or what it will index on that is where your multi-units are. Now you take a denture burr and you go broom, 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 broom through it. You get those open excess holes through which your sleeves can be put in. Sometimes you need to adjust it. So this used to take me a good hour, hour and a half to fabricate in-house if I'm doing it in-house. So that is the reason why I've gone digital and now I have everything prefabricated. It goes in direct. So what you do then, after you've done that, you pick it up the same way, either in protem, either in acrylic. Pattern resin is a very good material to pick up over there. Or you can use uh, composite whichever you feel comfortable with. Once you've picked it up, you cut away the entire palette or any you know area which goes on to the vestibule area or all of that has to be cut away. A convex surface has to be created and then you screw that into the patient's mouth. I hope I have answered that question in whatever little I could with the little time that I have. Yes, sir. Again, another question from Dr. Rahul Das. Sir, how do you determine implant occlusion for a full mouth implant case? Oh, it is, I mean, I can start, it will take me a good hour, hour and a half to finish, but very simply uh, give all the guidances for everything. I can share with the gentlemen uh, you know, articles on implant occlusion. It's a whole topic and I don't want to get into something you then have to stop halfway, but anterior guidance is important, canine guidance is important. Please do not keep any lateral interferences on your posteriors because those are the things that will cause the implants to fail. See, most times the days where we used to have hybrids, where we used to make denture teeth prosthesis, the denture tooth used to come out. It used to debond and we used to have headaches trying to rebond it. That it used to come out because that was the weakest link. Now, when today's materials, we are going into zirconia, you're going into titanium, you're going into even ceramic surfaces, those don't chip or break or, you know, the whole load goes onto the implant. And what's going to happen is the bone around the implant starts resolving, causing failure of your implant. So as a prosthodontist, I always like, or this is my preference, that when I am having a, a ceramic or zirconia-based framework for the upper, my lower will mostly be uh, in peak or uh, you know acrylic, as in denture teeth, because there has to be something that gives way. 
if everything is so firm something else will give way and the softest part there is your bone especially your maxillary bone because your maxillary bone is normally your uh, uh, d3 d4 or you know or a d2 a bone so always we don't want to put the loads on to that so your occlusion should be also in such a way that you take away loads from the implant per se and keep in materials which are soft which will kind of self adjust themselves rather than having to break things or cause your implant failures thank you sir uh, now we have the last question on zoom that's from dr samvil kenainan uh, sir asks how much is the waiting period between implantation and the final loading for the implant case now if for example sir this case i didn't have that drafting i would have immediately loaded the pmma prosthesis on the day of the surgery i will not wait because cross arch stability if you get on primary primary stable implants of 30 newton plus or a uh, 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 you know isq level of 70 plus you are safe to load immediately but if you have something where i grafted i did it later now you wait Three to four months for your implants to completely integrate with your bone, and then you can load them. So now I'm going to load them first with a provisional. Why I'm doing the provisional? Not because I'm afraid that the implant will fail, but because I want to correct all the aesthetics, the scalloping, all of that that I have created in my surgery. And then I would do my prosthesis, final prosthesis. There are times, and I have seen certain articles where they are actually loading the implants immediately. with the final prosthesis no provisional that all so sir there is a whole big debate to this and we can go on and on and i don't want to hold up the entire class for that thank you we <laughs> are welcome sir uh, so we just have one more question from dr pranit kumar it um, asks in digital workflow without big programming how do you decide how much to raise just by the willies gorge is that enough No, 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 no. Pravin Kumar, sir, please. Uh, I mean, who better to ask this question or answer it for that matter? But um, that entire phase where I made that uh, composite, right? That becomes my functional D programmer. If things go wrong in that, the vertical is not proper. I will keep correcting it till I get it right. So that becomes my functional splint now the reason i even earlier used to do composite as my this was because i feel something which is removable the patients don't really wear it they remove it they keep it aside you know even a retainer for an ortho patient how many times do our ortho patients actually they come back with teeth with their mood because they have not worn their retainer so patients are not compliant when you tell them oh wear it for as long as you uh, can you know don't remove it from your mouth for all these for the splint so for the deep programmers i like to have a working deep programmer if the patient start complaining of pain i know i have encroached the vertical dimension i am no like i said these are all guidelines they are not the only way to determine uh, the vertical dimension or your deep programming thank you sir just one more question from dr saji cheryan it says sir it's out of a it's an out of topic question but please brief on platform switching in implant prosthetics platform switching is great for holding the tissue in place and uh, i'm sure periodontist here will be in a better position to answer those questions but i like to use implants with platform switching uh, simply because it helps the 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 entire those fibroblasts which you know uh, have that they go around in circular motion around implants because they don't connect to the implant per se now we are having a prosthesis like zirconia which they claim that you have a fibroblast attachment to it once you sandblast it and there's a whole there's a whole concept which is coming into play and there every day you will read a new article which will tell you something different on it but yes platform switching i like i like to use and i would recommend also people to use platform switching thank you sir uh, dr shivdi please take on with the questions from the youtube please okay. thank you dr Okay, sir. So there is one question from Doctor Mehka Sri in uh, YouTube. Uh, sir, so after reflecting flap, how did the guide fit in some place for implant placement, or is it the different guide? It, it's asked by Doctor Mehka Sri. 
Okay, Dr. Mehta, this is, if you remember, I had put that scaffold base as my base uh, jig, the black one that I placed in. Once I have got that in with the flap reflected, everything else, that means from my digital denture to my scaffold, I mean, to my implant guide, to even my scallop guide, they all fit one into another. I will try and show you that I have them here in front of me. So you see, this is this is that scaffold guide which went in first. Once I re removed, uh, one sec. Let me see if I can remove the blur. So you see this. This is the scaffold guide, and then everything else just fits onto this. So whatever I use in for that case will fit like a jigsaw puzzle to it. So. If once this guide with, with the anchor pins, you see these three areas where you put the anchor pins, once they are in there into the patient's mouth, everything is just a jigsaw puzzle. So I can fit this and I have the, see this was my scallop guide. So I, that will also go into the same area, just like this, see, jigsaw puzzle. So it all fits in like that. So there is no issues as to reorienting. But before you put the base, make sure that the flap is really high. And once you've got that in, the base itself keeps the flap as a reflection and everything else just goes in. It's very easy. It becomes very easy. You don't have to keep holding that flap during the surgery. You must have noticed even when I did that surgical procedure. Okay. Thank you, sir. So our next question is for, by Dr. Veena Paul. She's asking, how do we decide the time period based on the case types for uh, uh, professionalization? What provisionalization. For provisionalization. Yes, okay. sir. So, uh, like I said, uh, a class one adapts the fastest. Class twos and class threes take a little longer to adapt. But like I always say, and it has been proven that every human being has a different tolerance level. So you increase the vertical. If the patient comes to you with pain, so from the time that the patient was comfortable after all your adjustments, whether it was the first appointment or the 10th appointment, I want four weeks post that for the patient to wear it without any trouble. No pain, no breakage, none of that. So I will not say from day one. I will say from the day the patient became pain-free, did not come back with issues, from that point onwards, hold it at least for four weeks is my way of dealing with these kind of cases. Okay. Uh, so one question from myself. Uh, so what yes. is the ideal features to look for uh, uh, for, for buying an intraoral scanner? Like what okay, are features can, to be? Okay, so one is a few things that it's a very good question because you know many people might get inspired to go and get their SSR and intraoral scanners. So one is you need to buy from firstly a reputed company because you want that company to support you for life. It's like buying a BMW or a Mercedes. You know that this company is not going to shut down. You know, it's going to have its representation all the time. See, we come across, we, I'm sure we've used a lot of implant companies and suddenly they disappear, you know, from the market. And when you want spares, you want this, you don't get them. So my first criteria is that I want after sales. Second, I want, so I'll, I'll give you, there was an article which I just read. There are a few uh, companies that I like and I can share with you. One is your Prime Scan from Densply Sirona. The other is your Three Shape, which I use and I prefer and I'll tell you why. Uh, the Medit 700 is a very good scanner. Uh, so these are my three scanners, which I kind of would like people to consider. Uh, of course, then there is a bit of finance. Understand a lot of people say, oh, you know, a lot of companies are right now coming in with, uh, you know, this does not have subscription, this does not have this. So you are tempted to buy that because you feel there is no recurring cost in it. But no subscription means two things. One, that you will get no support from them ever after that, or you're not getting updates. This digital dentistry is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, ma'am. On a day-to-day -day basis, I would not even say, you know, hour to hour, probably somebody right now in Denmark has created something new for my scanner. 
But if I don't get the update and I'm not getting that support, so many a times my scanner has an issue. So these people, they get onto a team viewers thing from uh, Denmark, come into my system, they correct it. By the time I finished my crown prep on my patient, my machine is sorted. So you want that kind of uh, you know, support from these people. The reason I bought 3Shape is because it has two things integrated with it. One is an implant studio software. Now, what is an implant studio software? It helps you design your entire surgical phase of implants in along with your scanning. So it's a software which is incorporated within my software. So I paid a little extra for that. But that helps me do all. Today, I would say 85% of my cases, implant dentistry are guided. Because believe me when I say that, a single tooth guided for a posterior molar. I'm out of my patient's mouth. My, my, my team actually now, you know, they, they time me 7 to 10 minutes. I'm out. Because all the hard work I have done on the software. And that I like to do. Because I am the clinician. I like to place my implant. I know what I like, what I don't like, that 2mm on the buckle. So that I don't like to outsource. But a case like this, which is so big, I don't have the time frame to get away from my clinical. Day. So those th once you get used to it, that implant studio, you take, say, 10 minutes to plan a case, single tooth, not more than that. Whereas the other scanners don't have this software, um, you know, like a edition. So that is why 3Shape for me stands up a little bit more. The speed of the prime scan is faster than that of 3Shape. Okay. You get, you will now get a lot. Now, very soon, the market is going to get infiltrated with a lot of Chinese uh, and uh, low, low, what we call low value scanners, but there will be no updates and the speed and also the accuracy. It's like buying an impression material. So if your impression material is not accurate, your polyvinyl siloxane has a lot of shrinkage. So these are images which are collimated. Right, so every image which is collimated should not have a this. So now again, a survey was done recently, unbiased. They found though the three shape is not the fastest, but it is the best or most accurate scanner. Okay. So you know there are a lot of things we can we can we can have a long good conversation on how to choose a scanner and with whom to choose a scanner. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, sir. No, ma'am. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now, before we, we go ahead with anything, I want to again repeat this one fact. And by looking at these cases that I have shown you, you may probably get intimidated. My request and my sincere request to everybody here is don't get intimidated. It looks fancy, but it is really simple. And that is why I am requesting everybody to get into digital dentistry because I want your clinical time reduced, your clinical mishaps reduced, you know, uh, and getting predictable outcomes without spending too much money. And believe me, all like I said, for all this, you already are sending work for CBCTs to your CBCT labs or your this, which you're outsourcing, right? You are, you are already um, uh, what we call uh, sending it to your labs for doing your uh, regular wax mock-ups. So all you're doing is you're now taking an intraoral scan and sending it to your lab for doing the same thing. You know, people, when they look at all these fancy pictures, these fancy videos, they get intimidated. I don't want you all to get intimidated. And if you need any finger holding or any hand holding, I'm here. Thank you. No. So, for a simple case, for a, a case uh, like the type 1 uh, cases like that, how long will it take to finish using this digital technology? Not a implant, case. simple I'm, cases. I'm talking about natural teeth, right? Natural yes, yes, yes. So, yes. Ma'am, I have, I don't want to boast or I don't want to this, but within five to six sittings, I have finished a whole case like that. Okay. Because you planned it so well. Okay. You have already planned it so precisely and hoping that the critical critical part in this case, ma'am, is that waiting period of four weeks where the uh, patient has yes, to be yes. pain free and not fracture things in the mouth. If he's fracturing things in the mouth, 
something you've done in his mouth is wrong and it's in composite so correct it if you understand what i'm saying yes. that is the time you need to as a good clinician spend to understand whether that patient is now adapting to your new you know prosthesis that you've given or not once you've got that base right then the rest is just about how long your lab will take to send it back to you ma'am okay okay um akil sir we just have two general questions uh, left uh, that is any plans of conducting online courses on uh, digital workflow for fmr cases and uh, when are you coming back to kerala for the next session these are the two general questions that we are left with i am catching the flight this evening and i am reaching there by tonight <laughs> nah it's it's all in your hands sanu ma'am it is all in your hands you all call me i am there and i would love to be there and, I, and i'm sure uh, the the people who i have associated with earlier they know how much i love to be and be a part of uh, you, uh, you know the whole yes, state sir. of kerala to be very honest so yes, i'm there on anyway now uh, as far as the digital courses on online go ma'am it's a little difficult to do online because to show things on the software and stuff it becomes difficult when i have multiple so we are now um, formulating one which will be come up probably in the month of april or uh, may which we are doing in bombay on the digital implant side of uh, uh, dentistry so now you know now full mouth has become like one your natural teeth and now full mouth is becoming implant you know so so what we do is it will be a 3 to 4 day implant course where we sit down and we start from basics so we go through occlusion vertical dimension which case you use fp1 which case you use fp2 understand those basics then give them cases so that they start discussing it and and working so we are doing a whole curriculum of that sort ma'am so online on digital is a little difficult it's great to do a webinar but I'm sure you all realize that. True that. 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 Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for taking out all that time and addressing all the queries that were posted. So, in the interest of time, uh, we shall proceed on to the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Akil, sir. You're most welcome. Yes. My pleasure. Totally, my pleasure. So, thank you, Doctor Sonu and Doctor Shibi. Uh, with this, we have come towards the end of today's program. Uh, I invite Doctor Annie Kitty George to deliver the vote of thanks. at the onset let me thank almighty god for everything we are and have on behalf of idea tirvella i thank dr akhil reshamwala for taking his time out and providing us with a very informative and enlightening session doctor thank you for showcasing your cases and their digital workflow doctor your passion is infectious and we look forward to having you with us for offline sessions in the future we express our sincere gratitude to dr nishan krishna state cd representative for inaugurating the session on behalf of idea tirvella i express our gratitude to gospel media and our past president dr simon george who provided us with the zoom platform all thanks to dr reji thomas president secretary dr thomas jacob of idea tirvella and other executive members of idea tirvella for putting this program together at this moment i would especially thank dr adarsh nainan son of dr samuel kainainan who has been master of ceremony and also has worked hard for making this program successful thank you moderators dr shivi and dr sonu idea tirvella extends its sincere gratitude to all participants who have enthusiastically responded and participated in the session we are thankful to all from other branches of ida and also for those who have joined us from outside the state we acknowledge the presence of senior and eminent clinicians and academicians who have joined us today on finally i thank ida tirvella for giving me this opportunity to represent them let me end with an old chinese proverb which says learning is a treasure that will follow its owners everywhere thank you all thank you so thank you. much ma'am thank you thank you dr akil thank you doctor thank you very much for informative talk <laughs> thank you dr akilesh akil 
my pleasure sir we will meet yeah we will meet once again in tiruvalla like what we did in 2010 we are expecting one our state cd chairman <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in November, Akhil. Yes, mostly. Huh? Done. Done, <laughs> Rajesh.